uh, if you're at home watching by Facebook, you can start getting your emblems uh, together and you can partake with us. I thank you for your encouragement here. We have a great church, a lot of good people. I'm sure God is going to bless us through his word today. And God brought you here for a reason today, and I know he wants to speak to you personally. Next Sunday is our uh, potluck Sunday. Is that it? Potluck Sunday next Sunday. So if you guys want to come uh, uh, next Sunday and have some delicious food, you're welcome to stay after this service. And uh, we'll have the potluck next Sunday. So let's open in prayer. Lord, we thank you that we can come today. We thank you, Lord, that you are still on the throne. And, Lord, we pray that you would open our ears and our hearts to your word today. Bless the worship time, Lord. Bless those who are watching by Facebook. And I pray, Lord, if they don't know you as their personal Savior, that you would uh, draw them to you this morning. Bless each one here today and meet their needs. You know what they are. That they can leave here today encouraged by your spirit, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, this all stand for worship.
like.
always on a God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, Though I do not fear God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wearies me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will advance them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Verse 9, and also he spoke this parable to some of those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, said, God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortionists, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give my tithe to all that I possess. And the tax collector stood afar off, would not so much as to raise his eyes to heaven. And he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then he's, verse 15 says, then also he brought infants to him and he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him and said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for such is the kingdom of God. I surely I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will no means enter in. So first of all, we talked about the parable of the persistent widow, the widow um, to teach us to persist, to be persistent in our prayers. Verse one, he said, he spoke a parable to them that men should always pray and not to lose heart. Why would a person lose heart in their prayer life? You ever lose heart in your prayer life? I think people get discouraged. They lose heart because uh, their prayers are not answered in the amount of time that they want it to be answered. Sometimes I know when I, when I pray, I give God a time limit. Okay, God, you got two weeks. <laughs> if you don't answer in two weeks, I'm going to get discouraged. I'm going to quit. But don't do that. People get disheartened or discouraged because sometimes God don't answer prayer the way they want it, them to answer. Because when I pray, I pretty much got the answer in my mind how I want him to answer. And usually he doesn't. So he said, I want you to be persistent in prayer and don't quit and don't give up. Just because you haven't seen it yet, it doesn't mean that you won't see it. Amen. You know, when Noah built the ark, it had never rained before. No one even heard a rain. No one even seen rain before. But he just kept on building. He just kept on building. Maybe you haven't seen it yet, but God works everything out in his own time. But in the meantime, we are to serve while we wait. We're not to just sit there and just wait and wait and wait and wait until God answers. I know God's been praying about going into the ministry for 10 years, and they're still waiting. I'm saying, man, get up and move, man. Go. Go, man. What's your waiting on? What's your waiting on? God has already spoken. Once God has spoken, it's no need to keep praying about it. It's time to move. Once God answers your prayer, it's, he's waiting on you now to get up and go. Or you'll be still waiting there for the next 50 years. So he said, he, we ought to pray and not to lose heart. We, the Bible said we should pray without ceasing. It doesn't mean that we're supposed to repeat the same prayers over and over and over and over again because Jesus warns against vain repetition in Matthew chapter 6. Unless we are sick or uh, smothering, we rarely even think about breathing. I don't even think about breathing. Unless I'm really sick, unless I'm smothering, I don't even think about breathing. 
we should do the same thing with prayer. It should be as natural as breathing. Satan trembles when a Christian prays. He don't care how mad you get. Satan don't care about that. He don't care if you disagree with him. He don't care about that. But when a Christian prays, Satan trembles because he knows, even Satan knows there's power in prayer. Even Satan knows it. Amen. Therefore, we must fight against impatience, uh, de delays. You know, uh, we, we, get, we get impatient. And we want to quit and give up. Colossians 4.2 says, continue in, pra in prayer. Be vigilant in it in thanksgiving. Continue in prayer. Be vigilant with all thanksgiving. Continue. Continue. I prayed for a building for 20 years before we got this building. I said, we'll never get a building. Man, we'll never get our own building. You, you know the story. I've said it before. We had to come here an hour and a half early and set everything up, sound system, chairs, and everything for 20 years. Then when the service is over, we got to take everything back down. 20 years. Well, one day we got a building. But in the meantime, we would go from place to place. They kick us out of one place, we go to another. I've been kicked out a few places, but that's beside the point. <laughs> yes, all right. I don't know where that came from. But anyway, uh, <laughs> rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, continually steadfastly in prayer. We lose heart, we give up, we get discouraged because the prayer don't, the answer don't come immediately. Immediately. And sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, and sometimes it's wait, sometimes it's not. It's, it's, it's not yet, so we get impatient. We have to stay busy serving God while we wait. Keep on praying. Verse 2 saying, there was a certain judge who did not fear God, nor regard man. Wow. I sure don't want to be in front of a judge like that. You don't, he don't fear God, and he don't even regard, have no respect for man. So, hmm. Now, there was a certain widow in that city. She came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. She wanted justice. She didn't want revenge, but she just kept coming. Get justice from my adversary. Get justice. Perhaps a woman was asking, uh, maybe she had a financial need that someone had, <clears throat> had gypped her out of some money or something. And he would not for a while, <clears throat> but after he said within himself, Though I do not fear God, nor regard man, I would hate to, you know, like I say, be putting the judge like this. Wouldn't you? Yeah. I don't fear God, nor regard man. But she troubles me. I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she worries me. She worries me. <clears throat> it was a word used for a boxer, when he gets a black eye, he, he's saying here that this woman here is coming to me all the time and she's worrying me to death. I got to do something with this woman because she's not going to stop coming. So I'm going to have to do something with it. He says she's wearing me out. This womb is the same womb that a boxer would give another boxer a black eye. What he's saying, this woman here is giving me a black eye. I got to do something with this woman. This poor widow, her persistence only obtained from an unjust man, what otherwise she wouldn't got she wouldn't have got her way. This get old, she just kept she kept coming. Do you do that? Do you, the Bible says, "Seek and you shall find; knock and you shall the door shall be open unto you." Then the Lord said, "Hear what the unjust judge said." Verse seven. He, and shall God not advance his own elect who crowd day and night to him, though he bears long with them? People of God, saints, Christians, his own elect, the chosen ones, shouldn't we be persistent like this widow? Should we be coming back again and again? I know I get impatient. I think God is always slow. You know, I think he's always slow, but he's always on time, I found out. Amen. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man come, will he find faith on the earth? 
You know, Luke, Luke mentioned this widow here, but Luke, Luke mentions this widow more than any other Gospels combined. In that day, usually it was very difficult to make ends meet for the widow. You know, she, did, she didn't have a husband. Uh, the church was serious about taking care of widows back in those days. And I think the church today still should be serious about taking care of widows even today. Uh, if Willow has family, I think the family should come in and take care of the widows and help them out. But if the family, if she don't have a family, I think the church, I think the church should come in and help her out. You know, and, but the Bible speaks very highly of widows in Acts chapter 6 when the widows were being neglected from the daily administration of food. You know, the, the apostles, they took care of that. The widow was being neglected with the daily administration of food. The apostles, hey, you know, we're going to take care of, we're going to be on the word of God in prayer, but you get you some men full of Holy Spirit and faith, and they're going to take care of them widows. 1 Timothy 5, 3 said, honor, honor widows who are really widows, who are wid widows indeed. They had to get on the list. They were living godly lives. If they were in fellowship, if they were reading the Bible and praying and living godly lives, uh, the church would help them out. The widow had three obstacles against them. This widow right here, First of all, she was a woman. A woman back in those days was like a second-class citizen. Had little standing before the law. In, Palest in the Palestinian society of our Lord's day, women did not go to court. She was a widow. She had no husband to stand with her in court. And above all, she was poor. She, you know, she could not bribe even if she wanted to, back in those days, you, you could bribe the attendant and they would kind of give you favor. Uh, the judge would move from town to town and whoever had the most money can give him a bribe. He would give you, uh, he would hear you first if you could, he could be bribed back in those days. She was poor. She couldn't get any attention. She couldn't afford even to pay the bribe. The bribe. They could be bribed back in those days, but she didn't have the money to even pay that. If you wanted to be heard, Jesus did not say that God's people are like this woman. In fact, he said, Jesus said the opposite. If a poor widow got what she, what she deserved from a selfish judge, what he's saying, this judge is very selfish because he didn't fear God and he didn't care anything about man. He was saying, if a poor widow can, can get what she deserved from a selfish judge, how much more would God's children receive what is right from a loving father. Our loving father is opposite. He's shown us the contrast between this unjust judge and God. The difference, uh, the contrast. You know, this woman, she was a stranger. She was a stranger. This woman was a stranger. But we are children of God. We are no strangers. And God cares for his children. This woman had no access to the judge. But God's children have an open access into his presence. And many come and we may come day and night, anytime we want to. But when Christian believers pray, they have in heaven a Savior who is an advocate. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is our high priest who constantly represents us before the throne of God. He represents us before the throne of God. When we pray, we can open the word and we can claim all the promises I heard there was 546. I don't know if that's true or not. I never counted them. But there's a lot of promises for the believer. When we open the Bible, we can claim all the promises. But the widow had no promises that she could claim. She had to try to convince. She had to try to convince the, ju the judge. She had to try to convince the judge to hear her case. We not only have God's unfailing promises, we also have the Holy Spirit to assist us in our prayer life. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know, we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groaning which cannot be uttered. Now he who such is a heart knows, knows the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So when you don't know how to pray and you don't want to use the right words, the Holy Spirit will pray for you because he knows what you're trying to say. Maybe you can't express it in words, but he says he even helps us in our weaknesses. Isn't that beautiful? You ever feel weak? I know you do, so I know I do. 
you know, feel weak, but the Holy Spirit was there. Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I'm going to send the comforter, the one that comes along beside you to help, the paracletus. He's going to come to help you. He wants us to know we're not in this thing all by yourself. He just going to throw you out there and say, well, you guys just figure it out. See you. No, we got a comfort. We got the Holy Spirit. This judge, contra he contrasts the father. You know, uh, this woman had to argue with this judge and try to convince this judge to hear a prayer, but God is not like that. God is a loving father who is attentive to our prayer. He's very generous in his gifts. He's concerned about our every need and ready to answer when we call him. The only reason the judge helped this poor widow because she was, maybe he was afraid, uh, maybe he was weary. Uh, she, he was just getting worn out, so he wanted to just get her off his back. But you know, you can come to God 24-7. You will never weary him. You are never a bother. You are never a pest to him. When you come to God over and over and over and over, and over again, he don't say, well, Man, here you come again? <laughs> you don't say that. You can come, tw you can come to God a hundred times a day. I don't see why anybody wouldn't. They say a proud person can't pray. Maybe that's true. Now, this is a selfish judge. This judge is a selfish judge. Finally, you know, he meets the need of the widow. But how much more is our Heavenly Father willing to meet our needs? When we cry out to him, he, we're, we're not pestering God when we come. We're not a nuisance when we come. Matter of fact, he wants you to come. He wants you to come. You can't come too many times. He is willing to answer. The widow had no lawyer, but we have a high priest at the throne of God in heaven. She had no promises, but we have the Bible full of promises. She was an outsider. She was an outsider, but we're not an outsider anymore. We are the children of God. Do you believe that? You can't get any higher than that. You can't get this on CBN, NBC. This is, this is the highest you can get when you come to administer, receive him. To them, he gives the power to become what? Children of God, even to those that believe on his name. That's what you are. No matter how you feel, that's what the scripture teaches you want to try to, if you can, see yourself the way God sees you. When I look at myself, I see all the imperfections. But when God sees me through the blood of Christ, he sees a son of God, forgiven. He said, when he comes, shall he find faith on the earth, the second coming, you know, when the Lord comes. The end times will not, it's not it will not be days of great faith. Eight people were saved in Noah's day. Only out of, four out of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, the second, the second coming before Christ comes, will there be faith on the earth? Hmm. The Bible speaks of a great apostasy, 1 Timothy 4. The Spirit is expressly say that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, given heed to the seven spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. If that's, a, that's what's going to happen. He said, before the second coming, before Christ comes, it's going to be the same way it was in Noah's day. The Bible says, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, says perilous times will come. Perilous times are going to come. So men will be lovers of themselves. You see that today? People are lovers of themselves. You see, uh, lovers of money. You see that today? Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Do you see that today? Unthankful, unholy, unliving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control. That's what the Bible teaches. Without self-control, brutally, despisers of good, despisers of good. Do we see that today? Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Do we see that today, right now? Jesus said when he comes, will he find faith on the earth? Very, it's going to be very rare when he comes. The falling away has already started. The great falling away. Sadly to say, hate to say it, but it's already 
falling away. He said the last day, people going to have a form, uh, they're going to have a form of godliness, but deny their power. Hmm. People are falling away. Why? Maybe caught up in the world. Maybe something else has taken their focus away from Christ. I know uh, people are not in fellowship like they used to. Uh, many, many things can cause you to fall away. But just don't you fall away. No matter what anybody else does, you just keep on serving Christ, man. You just keep on going. You, don't, you just don't quit. You just don't stop. But in the last times, Jesus said it's going to be perilous times and many are going to fall away from the faith. Verse, four, verse 9 said, Also he spoke this parable to, to some who trusted in themselves. Now how could anybody trust in themselves? Well, here, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, verse 9. Also he spoke this parable to, to, to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. You can always find somebody worse than you are. I mean, it make me look real spiritual when I find somebody worse than I am, right? Well, that's not right, but these guys did. You know how the Pharisees are, you know. Two men, verse 10, went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee was religious, self-righteous, and the tax collector, the tax collectors were hated in those days. They worked for the Romans. People hated tax collectors. They hated them. Verse 11, then the Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself. God, I thank you that I, look at the, he got to his the five eyes. Look how many times he's going to use I, starting in verse 11. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, says, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. I ain't bad as them. Extortioners, unjust, adulterous, or even as this tax collector. He think his good works is going to make him righteous before God by what he did or what he didn't do. He said, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. I, 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 I. So he's very self-centered and he's very self-righteous. The focus is on him and not on God. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He asked for mercy. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You know, throughout Jesus' public ministry, he exposed the self-righteous, uh, the self-righteous Pharisees. He always exposed them. Because he knows that self-righteousness is going to lead to pride every time. And pride go before destruction and a hardest spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16, 18. The sad thing is that the Pharisees were completely deluded and thought they were right in their own eyes. They were self-righteous. They thought they were right. The Pharisees were deluded about prayer. So he prayed within himself and told God, you know, Anybody else, and anybody else who was listening, he told God, say, he was doing all these good works. He was telling God how good he was. The Pharisees used prayer as a means to get, to get public rep recognition and not a spiritual exercise to glorify God. He wanted to be seen of man. He was deluded about himself for he taught that he was accepted by God because of what he did and what he did not do. He trying to get salvation by works. The Jews were required to fast only once a year, the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16, 29. But he fasted twice a week. He tithes everything that he had that came to his possessions. Even the tiny herb from his garden, he would tithe. He was deluded about the, the publican who was also in the temple praying. The Pharisees thought that the publican was a way worse sinner than he was, which he wasn't. The Pharisee was a sinner too, just as bad. So he thought the, the publican was a worse sinner, but the publican went home justified 
by God while the proud Pharisee went home self-satisfied within himself. The publican went home justified. To be justified, what does that mean? It, be, it means to be declared righteous before God. To be justified means because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross and you got him as your savior, his righteousness has been imputed to you and now it's not your own righteousness. What Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, it's God's righteousness. The publican repeatedly smote his breast for he knew what his problem was. He knew he was a sinner and he knew he needed God's mercy and he knew he needed God's grace, but the Pharisees didn't. So he called for mercy. The, the publican, he admitted that he was a sinner. The Pharisees' pride condemned him, but the, public's, the publican's Humble faith, his humble faith saved him. The Pharaoh could see, the Pharaoh could see the sin of others, but not their own sin. They couldn't see the log in their own eye, but they could see the speck in everybody else's eye. When the publican admitted that he was a sinner and he knew he was a sinner and would not even raise his head up to heaven and he beat his breast and asked for God's mercy, the Bible says he went down justified. That means forgiven, justified, declared righteous before God. He went home forgiven. You have, we have also been justified, declared righteous, the righteousness of Christ. When you put your faith in Christ, in Christ, you have been justified. It means you are in right standing with God. It means that God is no longer mad at you. Don't go around thinking God's against you and he's mad at you. And the first time you mess up, boy, he's going to hit you over the head with a hammer and say, I'm done with you, man. You crossed the line. Never would that happen. It means that God keeps no more records of your sin. Your sins... He will remember no more. Yeah, mercy. We are justified by what? Faith. And, if, and the publican, you know, he stood afar off. He know he was unworthy to draw near to God. But that was the way, that was the way he came near. He stood afar off and he knew he was unworthy to approach God. But that was the very thing that brought him the closest. He, he knew he was unworthy. He knew he was a sinner. Would not even so much slipped up his eyes to heaven. You know, he was so ashamed. But he was conscious of his sin. He knew he was a sinner. Men who are conscious of, of their sin, sometimes is so, they are so shameful, they are afraid to even look up. Sin makes a person feel ashamed and embarrassed. He smoked his breast like grief and anguish. He said, be merciful for me. Be merciful. The prayer of the publican was totally different from the prayer of the Pharisee. He made a boast of his own righteousness toward God. The Pharisee, he felt that he was not a sinner. And the Pharisee would not acknowledge that he was a sinner. Oh, I thank God I'm not like the rest of them people. Ask for mercy, and this is the kind of prayer that God will accept. When a person can humble, them, humble themselves and repent and acknowledge their sin and ask for mercy. I still ask for mercy, don't you? I still, till this day, I will continually ask for mercy till this day because I still sin. I'm not perfect yet. I know there are some that teach perfection, Christianity perfection, that you can be perfect in this life. That's not true at all. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So this publican, he's, he didn't try to hide it. He didn't try to cover it up. The tax collector prayed. 
This should, this should be our prayer every day. Mercy. Mercy. Don't let pride cut you off from God's blessings. Don't let your sin cut you off from God's blessings. When you sin, you lose fellowship with the Father. You can restore that fellowship if you confess and acknowledge and repent of your sins. You can come right back into right standings and come right back into fellowship with God, but it takes you to do it. Don't be like this Pharisee and try to say, oh, I think I'm... No. There were sinners too and couldn't recognize it. The prayer of the Pharisees before God was meaningless. It meant nothing. Because they said within themselves, look at me. The Republican made no excuse for his sins. He came in total humi humility. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Wow. The Pharisees who depended on his self-righteousness, he depended upon his self-righteousness, was not justified and therefore lost like so many people today, lost. You can't justify yourself. You can't save yourself, and you can't keep yourself saved. There's no way, no matter what you do. I, I, it's the hardest thing for me to convince people, even till this day. People think that they can be saved by what they do, by their good works. And I know a lot of good people that do good things. I know a lot of good people that should be Christians, but they're not. They do a lot of good things. They help people. They're generous. They're, they'll do anything for you. But they still are not Christian. You cannot get to heaven by your own merit, by good works. I don't care what you do. If you could, it would have been no need for Christ to come and die on the cross in the first place. You could have saved yourself, but you can't. And so many people I talk to, they think, well, if I do enough good things and if, if, if the good outweighs the bad, man, uh, I'm going to make it in. No, you, no. By grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works. It's not of works that any man can boast. You can't, get, you can't boast. You can't get to heaven and boast how good you were. Oh, I made it to heaven, ma'am. I made it to heaven because I was so good. No. By grace are you saved through. It's not of yourself. It's a free gift. And so many people are damned because of this script. They are, they are on their way to hell because they think that they can live up to God's standards and nobody can. That's why he sent Christ. Because he knew you couldn't do it. It's hard to convince people that. I, I talk to people, they say, well, I'm okay. Well, how do you know you're okay? Well, I go to church. Well, that doesn't save you. Well, I'm a good person. That doesn't save you. Well, my uncle was a Christian, or my aunt, or my grandmother, or my mother. That doesn't save you either. It's very simple. It's a free gift. Anyone can go. Anyone can be forgiven. Anyone that will do it God's way can have eternal life and forgiveness of sin. If you do it any other way, you're not going to make it. Because wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way. And few that be that find it. It's, to me, it's very simple. To admit, because God already knows, he already knows anyway. So when you admit and confess your sins, you're not telling God anything that he doesn't know. He that covers his sin will not prosper. But he that forsakes his sin will find mercy. Am I willing to do that? Oh, boy, this, this is so many people I know. I says, man, how can I reach these people? But all of my years of ministry, it's been just the hardest thing that I could ever convince people that's, hey, you cannot make it just because you're good. We are, sin we are sinners. And that's just, you might as well just admit it. And we need forgiveness and we need God's grace and his help if you're going to go to heaven. Amen. Well, the Pharisee thought, I'm better. I'm a Pharisee. I know the law, man. I know the Old Testament scripture, man. I know the Pentateuch. I know the Torah. Oh, man, I'm, I'm going to make it. Jesus said the other man admitted his wrong and went down justified. The Pharisee 
he went home lost. He was just as lost. That's what he showed up. He went home. He was still lost. You can't depend upon your religion. You can't depend upon yourself. Well, you see my point. Verse 15, Jesus blesses the little children. Then they, they mean the parents, also brought infants to him that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them, rebuked the parents for bringing their kids. But Jesus called them to him and said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of God. As surely I say to you, as surely I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will no means enter in. It was customary for the Jews to bring little children to the rabbis to receive a special blessing. So it is strange that the disciple would stand in the way of this. Uh, perhaps they thought that Jesus was too tired, uh, uh, too busy. Uh, maybe he, they thought that he had no really no interest in children. So the disciples rebuked the parents for bringing the kids. But they were wrong. The disciples thought the children was unworthy of the master's time. Jesus wants us to be like these little children. In other words, Jesus wants us to be childlike, but not childish in our faith. Childlike, but not childish. An unspoiled child illustrates Humility, faith, independence. That's what Jesus is teaching here. Jesus is teaching a lesson here. A child is completely dependent upon his parents. A child is completely dependent upon his guardian. Likewise, we ought to be totally dependent upon the Lord the same way that that child is dependent upon his parents. We ought to be totally dependent upon the Lord. The only way to enter God's kingdom is to be born again, John 3. If the proud Pharisee had come, if he had come like a child, he would have gone home justified, just like the sinner. If he had come like the publican, he could have gone home also justified. They says, suffer little children, Jesus began to rebuke him. They thought the children was annoying, was a, a uh, were pestering Jesus. They thought he, the children was a nuisance. Hey, suffer the little children to come to me. He that does not enter the kingdom of God like a little child will no wise, no wise enter in. A childlike faith. Red or yellow, black or white, he are precious in his sight. Jesus loved the little children of the world. I think if a dad... I might know we have dads here today. I think dad have a responsibility to introduce their children to Christ. That's what I did. I'm not going to be out here ministering to the whole world and let my whole family and not minister to my whole family. The family comes first, even before the ministry. I think it's a dad responsibility and I think it's a dad's duty to share the gospel with their children and ask their children to invite Jesus to come into their life to be their Lord and Savior. That is the duty of the parent. I know many children get to college and they fall away. I know that. A lot of them get to college and fall away, but you can't control what a kid's going to do later. You just lead them to Christ. And I think if he's truly saved, I think if he's truly born again, he, I think he will come back. Because I, I, I think that once you receive Christ, if you backslide, you're going to be miserable the rest of your life because you got the Holy Spirit going to go wherever you go. You're going to take the Holy Spirit with you. That's why a backslidden Christian is so miserable. I've met so many backslidden Christians that knows the scripture, used to come to this church backslidden, and they are absolutely miserable because they know what the word says and they're trying to, and they're trying to fit in with the world but it's not the same as it was because they know now enough about the word of God to be miserable. So I said, man, come on back, man. Come on back. He'll accept you. 
But I think it's a dad's job to lead their children to Christ. It is a privilege and a responsibility. It is not the church's responsibility, it's the parents. It is the parents. Churches might have Sunday school classes and all of that, but it's not the, par- it's not the church's responsibility. It is the parents to lead your children to Christ. You, you sit down with them and you ask them. And if they don't understand the gospel, then you explain the gospel to them. And you ask the question now, would you like to receive Christ right now? I want you to receive Christ right now. And you pray with them. And you make sure you get them up on Sunday morning and you bring them to church. But they're not going to be with you forever. They're going to soon be up and they're going to be gone, man. They're going to be gone to, you know, college. I know, I know a lot of kids get to college and they fall away from the Lord. But, you know, you don't know what, I mean, once you've done your job, you're not responsible really for what they do later. But as a parent, you've done your job. So, parents, if you have some kids that don't know the gospel, you pray with them. And you encourage them to receive Christ. Because kids now are facing things that they I never had to face. Never. It's rough out there. It is rough out there. And with this social media, the social media is just blinding. It's just putting all this stuff on these kids' head. And the kid, he's not able to siphon it. He's not able to sift it out, what's good and bad. So he's putting all this stuff on social media all day, six, seven hours a day in their mind. And that's just total of the enemy. So parents, I'm just going to say, don't let your kids run loose on that internet. You better be screening that thing. You better be, uh, you better be watching what, you better be in tune with what they're watching because they can watch anything on there. Some, now, I'm not saying all the internet is bad. You and I might be able to tell what's good and bad, but a young mind can't. That's why you got to know what, they, what they're watching. And if, you, if, if they're watching something they should not be watching, then you take that computer away from them. You take that phone away from them. You cannot be putting that junk in your mind because that's going to control you. And that's how a lot of people control children right now through social media. Dangerous. I never had to deal with that. When I was going to school, man, you know, I didn't even, I didn't even have a calculator going to school. You had a pen and some paper, and you had to add that stuff up and carry the numbers over in your head. Uh, she would hit you over the head with a, 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 a ruler. They had a ruler. Boom. Peers nowadays say, you got a calculator? I go, what is that? A calculator. I ain't had no calculator going to school. But they got them now. But my point is just being, parents, be on guard. Be on guard. Because I think Satan now, it's after the children, after the young minds. I know when I was growing up, my parents knew who I was at all the time, and they knew who I was with. And I had a certain time to get home. You got to know, man. And now Satan has come inside the house through social media and brainwashing the children. And that's why homes you see right now is just tore up. The home right now is worse than ever. Families are breaking up left and right. Be on guard, parents, and ask God to show you, help you. Talk to your children. It's people, when I was growing up, people had to, inter- they had to interact, they had to talk. Anymore, people don't since we have social media. People talk on Facebook, but that's not the same. When I was growing up, you had to make friends. You had to open up a conversation. You had to meet your neighbors, and you could, you could have a conversation. In a more, boom, a text message. Facebook, boom. But don't bother me, man, because I ain't got the time. Times has really changed, hasn't it? Pray for your children, too. Pray for your children, uh, especially before they get married, 
someday they will be married. Someday they will be gone away from you. Parents, you should start praying for your children's spouse right now. Start praying for their spouse. Lord, bring the right person into their lives. Bring the right wife. Bring the right husband into their lives. Because if you marry the wrong person, God help you. God help you, man. I mean, I've seen <laughs> your life can be absolutely ruined. Now, I don't want to scare people, but uh, you're not going to find a perfect mate because no one's perfect, right? No one's perfect. But you want to try to get as close as you can. You know what I'm saying? So with that, we'll close and pick up next week. Amen. And uh, we're going to continue to go through the word and we're going to continue to edify each other and pray for one another. So let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, that we can come and hear your word. I just pray if there's anyone here that's watching by Facebook, Lord, if they're not a Christian, if they haven't received Christ as a Savior, I pray you would convict them and draw them to you today. Help us to continue in prayer. Be persistent like the widow and not give up and not to quit. We thank you and we praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Lord, bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you his peace. Amen. God bless you.